Today marks that first Sunday of Advent, the season of expectant waiting, of preparation for the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the newborn King. So as we embark on this season of preparation, I invite you at this time to take a deep breath in. Imagine that what above you is a star-lit night. Stars shining. And in that moment, all is calm and all is bright. This year is the 200th anniversary of the classic Christmas Isn't Christmas Without It hymn, Silent Night, Holy Night. This hymn has become the best love worship moment of many Christians, even those who only come to church once a year. Something magical happens as we light our candles and sing of the hope for all that comes with all is bright and all is calm. Peace and light for all the world. During this Advent season, we will celebrate the carol's message and highlight its call for our lives that can lead us forward throughout all the year. This week, our focus will be on verse 1. We did sing 2 because we switched it up to fit in the children's program. So that's why we got two verses today. Today, our focus is on peace. The peace that is afforded to each one of us through the birth and the life of Jesus. Please pray with me. God of grace and God of peace, during this holy season of waiting and expectation, help us to be present, to be attuned to what this season is really all about. Help us walk slowly into Advent, being ever mindful of all the holy happenings of this season. Help us open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to the many examples of your presence in our world. Help us to walk slowly into Advent so that we may be ready to kneel at the manger and greet that newborn baby with peaceful hearts and peaceful minds. We pray all of this in your holy and precious name. Amen. One of the most famous and maybe well-known stories about this beloved hymn, Silent Night, Holy Night, took place in 1914 during World War I. The British and the German soldiers were on the front lines, and they called a truce on that Christmas day. The encampments from which they were fighting one another were so close that you could still hear each other, And they could hear, in that peaceful moment, they could hear the singing of Silent Night, each in their own native language, German and English. This prompted the soldiers on both sides to come out, to meet out in that middle no-man zone, without any weapons in hand. And they spent that day playing football exchanging small gifts, whatever they had, shaking hands, laughing, greeting each other, and wishing each other a Merry Christmas. That Christmas Day truce offered both sides a glimpse into the humanity of the other, allowed them to see the other as a person rather than as a target or as an enemy. This same humanity can be found in the Holy Infant, for whom God desires a heavenly place, peace. This morning, let's think about ways that we can bring peace and calm and bright to each of our own corners of this world. Today's reading from Isaiah 9 offers us a prophetic look at the coming of Christ, at the coming of the Messiah. The book of Isaiah goes dates back to the 8th century B.C. As a piece of prophetic writing, It addresses the many, many situations at the time that needed guidance, that needed a little bit of refocus for the people. The entire book of Isaiah offers warning to kings and to people like you and me. As we all know, the people that people throughout all of time have needed 
and will likely continue to need warning, guidance, and refocus. Tradition and the well-known liturgy have turned Isaiah 9 into a foreshadowing for the coming of Jesus, for the birth of the Messiah. It is a text from the Old Testament that connects the good news of the New Testament. This prophetic poem, which actually begins in Isaiah 9-2, offers to replace the gloom and the anguish with joy and with praise. And amidst this shift in emotions, there is still great need for faith, for trust, for expectant waiting. The expectant joy that comes in the words we read in verse 6. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Indeed, Isaiah tells us the victory is won not by military might or strength, or the ingenious strategy of the generals in charge, but rather the fog gets cleared. The fog is lifted by the creation of life, not by its destruction. Peace rests on the shoulders of a small child. Authority over all nations is reserved for this young little child. Isaiah's prophecy begins our Advent season by encouraging our imaginations to seek ways to flip the status quo, to alter our own expectations. This child being born is helpless, yet all authority rests upon his shoulders. This child is small and young, but he is the leader of all nations. This child cries to be fed, to be cared for, but he is the prince of peace. In Isaiah's passage, we get some of the initial glimpses of what salvation will look like in God's world. It looks a lot like peace. And this peace, this peace of God, rises up as an alternative to conflict. Isaiah is asking us to look at some, look someplace other than this world, other than human victories and understandings for salvation. We are urged to look instead to this one small child. This Isaiah text connects well to our gospel today. In Isaiah, there is a call for people to faith, even when the world seems void of worth and significance, even when the world is crazy and hard to understand. The birth of the Messiah that we read about in the Gospel of Luke this morning and will revisit each week speaks of a relatively common event, given all that surrounds it. A child is born to a young family who, like many others of the time, are struggling just to survive. The feelings of peace and joy and hope that can be found in Isaiah 9 come amidst a time of uncertainty and fear and risky things happening in the world. The story of the birth of Jesus in Luke takes place in a hard world of refugees and political oppression. However, Jesus the Messiah, in coming into a real and risky world, is also coming into this world to proclaim joy and celebration and to bring about peace. Now, it may seem a bit odd to start our Advent season with the story of Jesus' birth, because usually that happens at the end. (laughs) But I think it's where we should always begin, beginning with the end in mind. But rather than focusing only on Jesus today, I want to take some time to look at those shepherds. Just as Jesus was born in in humble circumstances, humble too were those first hearers of the good news. The lowly shepherds. The angel tells the shepherds that they will see a sign confirming the birth of the Messiah, an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Through the use of the word sign, Luke alludes to Old Testament practices where God or a prophet makes an announcement saying this is a sign, a promise from God. So our reading from Isaiah 9 offers us an example of a promise. And the sign in the Gospel of Luke points to the incredible fact that this child, this little child lying in a manger, is already 
the Messiah. Already the Lord. The sign to the shepherds offers a reminder of the importance of being present for all people, of being humble rather than boastful. The Messiah, in agreement with his humble origins, will be a friend to all, will reach out to all. The shepherds, when they received this sign, went to go see this Messiah. They took the sign and the message seriously, and they found Jesus just as they had been told, peacefully and humbly lying in that manger. The shepherds entered into this humble space, but are also, in fact, witnesses to the beginning of what would be a life filled with miracles. The shepherds had no idea what the future would hold, but they knew that they were seeing and experiencing something that was like no other, that this was a big deal. Like the shepherds, we often do not know what our futures hold, and we can find ourselves in places of excitement and hope and fear all at the same time. For those who have cared for an infant, you know the feeling of hope and fear, and they can be so tightly knitted together. If you've cared for a sick relative or a friend, you know what it means to both have the feelings of stress and hope for healing. If you've entered into a business or an educational endeavor, I imagine that they are also faced with uncertainty and excitement all at the same time. This world is full of emotions, juxtaposed with each other, full of experiences, that can lead us to places of anxiety, but can also bring us to places of great, great peace. As we remember this story and those characters within it, let us remember and be encouraged to hear the promise that God is working through them for all of us. These shepherds were called out from the fields. At the bottom of the socioeconomic world of first century Palestine, these shepherds had no rights, no expectations, no hope in the world of ever being touched by the divine. Yet there they were, in the field, receiving a message, a sign from the divine through the words and the appearance of a heavenly host. And so upon hearing this sign, they don't walk. They run to that stable, stumble over upon the peaceful scene of this mother and child and wonder, beyond all wonders, what they have just seen. And then they tell everybody. They meet. Everybody they meet, they tell what they witnessed. They have indeed have been touched by the divine, and they can't help but share what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced with everybody. They have now become bearers of the light. During this Advent season, our exploration of the hymn Silent Night is a way of shining a light on the power of reaching out across divides, getting silent enough to listen to the hopes and fears for all the years of those that tend to be cast as the enemy or simply as different for one reason or another. I remind you once again of those brave soldiers who inched their way out, came out from their own encampments that Christmas morning. First, just one, then another, then more and more until they had all stepped out into that open space. May their story serve as a reminder to connect face to face, to use our own agency, to reach out across the divides, and to connect with others. We are all humans with common human needs, and deep down, We all have a desire for peace, peace for ourselves and peace for those around us. Who knows, when you reach out, you might just change the course of history, even if just for that one day. I opened our time with a question to think about. So we're going to close with a chance to revisit it here, and I encourage you to continue to do so during the week. The question was, are there ways that we can bring peace and calm and bright to our own corners of this world? Maybe it's doing a not-so-fun household chore so your loved one can take a break. 
Maybe it's smiling at that person in the grocery store who appears to be feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Maybe it's putting aside our electronics and playing a family game together. Maybe it's taking time for a walk and enjoying the beauty that surrounds us all. And maybe, for our kids in the room, it's inviting someone who is alone to play with you at recess. These are just a few examples. The options are endless. I invite you in the coming days to think of ways that you can bring peace and calm and shine that light to all you meet. To bring that peace and calm to each of your own corners of the world. And I encourage you to do it. To really think about it. In a few minutes, we'll be sharing in communion. Once you receive your communion elements and sit back down, I encourage you to be in a time of prayer. To pray with God as you begin to figure out where God is calling you to bring peace and calm in God's name to your corner of the world.